who's already spoken. Um, so as this slide says, I'm Jill Holden. I'm the Principal Officer for the Early Childhood Unit at NCB. I'm really delighted to be here today. So why this topic for today is Octavia's already set the scene for uh, why this topic, as have Ada um, and Phil. So thank you for that. But I thought it was really good as well that we can just take a little bit of opportunity to take a step back and reflect and give ourselves some, uh, some headspace. So while emotional health and well-being always an important subject, but I believe even more so now than ever uh, because of everything that's happening. I don't need to, uh, to tell you all about that. Um, I just wanted to set a little bit of context just before, uh, before Debbie starts. So thinking about right back to the very, very basics. Um, I like things, anybody who knows me well will know think I like things very simple. Um, so back to the nutshell of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If we don't feel um, secure, we don't learn and develop. And that goes for children as well as adults. Um, so at the moment, we are incredibly, incredibly busy dealing with these bottom two levels. So the basic physiological needs of food, clothing, shelter and the basic safety needs. So lots of stuff about making sure that children have um, adequate food, lots and lots and lots of cleaning and hand washing, lots of quarantining of soft toys uh, and books and all the like that's going on at the moment. But what about the rest, the other three elements of this set uh, of this pyramid? Um, you know, everything that we knew is different. We keep talking about the new normal. Um, what is normal? Um, so what I think is, you know, this isn't rocket science, but it is often forgotten about. So hopefully today will just give us a chance to take that breather, something that was so busy in the earlier set. We don't often get that time for that bit of headspace to go. I know this. I've got this. I can do this. OK, so what do we know? So I'm no neuroscience expert like uh, like the wonderful Debbie is. However, it's an area that really, really interests me. And I've done a lot of reading and research. And what I was thinking about recently is what we do know around the things that what we did know, what we do know now and what will we know? And we know that these things change. What we learnt in the past isn't always the same now, and we're still learning new theories and new developments as things go along. And thank goodness, uh, we only need to think about medical uh, science and how things have developed there, um, and only have to look at history books around the, the barbaric medical procedures that we used to use. So we're hoping that today will help us set the scene and the context for what we can do to continue to support children and young people. So what do we see? This is something I'm hearing so much about in all the projects I'm, I'm running at the moment. The things that we see, the things that are out there are the behaviours, um, adults' behaviours, children's behaviours. I don't need to go through any of these. Um, we see big behaviours, little behaviours, and all of these caused by the anxieties and things that are going on at the moment. I'm not going to dwell on any of these because I know uh, Debbie will. Um, but again, the old iceberg adage, what don't we see? OK, we see the behaviour. What don't we see that's below the water? So just want to sort of focus on the point that we're all um, architects or actually I should rephrase that and say structural engineers and um, being married to one and having a, a grown up son who's a structural engineer. They would really tell me off if I talked and said it was architects that made all the buildings stand up. And I believe they just do the pretty pictures. And um, so we are all structural engineers of children's brains. We're building children's brains. Everything you say, everything you do are laying those very foundations. And we just felt that today was a really good context to be able to have a focus on that. And some time of element to pat yourselves on the back and realize all the stuff that you're doing that sometimes we don't go, oh, I did that, I did that really great. Okay, so in part of me putting together and as pulling together this uh, event today, um, we put a call out for some case studies and just a huge thank you for people who've got back in touch with me and offered case studies. Um, we've only got time to show two of them today. So two that are focusing on different elements. You'll have thousands and thousands of activities and ideas and things that you're doing, which we'd like you to share in the discussion rooms later. And also um, if you've got anything else that you want to share that you want us to help and put up on the Foundation Years website so that we can spread that further please please do so that just leads me on um very nicely to just say um, and what about you um and a massive thank you to everything that everybody's doing every day and some twee stuff okay i like twee too so what are you doing to take care of you you know we get on an airplane well <laughs> we did get on an airplane we can't know can we but what's the first thing they say is put your oxygen mask on before you help anybody else 
the old adage of you can't pour from an empty jug. I know that's something um, in conversations that, and I can't see her at the moment, but I know Debbie will be smiling because this is something that Debbie says to me, Julie, you can't pour from an empty jug. And a little phrase that I found and, and pinched off social media this week, if you don't make time for your wellness, you'll be forced to make time for your illness. Read that again. I just, I just really liked that and it really resonated with me, um, on, both on a personal and practical, uh, prefers, well, personal and professional level. Okay, so finally, just a massive thank you from me personally, from all at NCB, DFE and Ofsted, and most importantly, from the children and the families that you're working with for all the things you do to support children and young people, be that direct, face-to-face, -face, or be that one step removed in a, in a tutoring role or an advisory role. Um, don't forget that you're all still making a huge difference. So without further ado, I have the huge pleasure of introducing Debbie to you. We're really fortunate to have Debbie as one of our NCB associates. She's also an author, a trainer, a consultant, and just a generally all round lovely, lovely person. She has an incredible passion for neuroscience and, and promoting children's emotional uh, well-being. And I know that you're really going to enjoy uh, Debbie's session. Uh, so it is um, a quick introduction. Um, as Jill said, I do all kinds of different things, including uh, being an NCB associate. Um, so this is really based on uh, the research that's accumulated in the, the last three books and the next three books. Um, but it's 35 years next year, which is ridiculous because in my head I'm 23, so I'm sticking with that. Um, I can't believe that I've actually been doing this for 35 years. And more recently how the neuroscience and the science starting to help us to understand why we do the things that we do we, we know a lot of this but now we've got the proof so this first session is just a quick 10-15 minutes just a bit of an introduction to lay the scene really uh, for the rest of the afternoon um, so I'm just going to have a quick look through but I'm not going to read every slide out because you, you, you've got them there and you've got copies of them but it is a whistle stop, stop tour in a very short time but I'll get in as much as I can. Um, it, it's pulling together some of the things that we know um, and particularly as Jill said how, how can knowing some of this now during this pandemic, during the lockdown, during what may come um, over the next six months, as well as what we've already dealt with over the last nine months, how can we use some of this knowledge, some of this science to help us um, with how we're all feeling and how children are feeling? Okay, so by the end of the session, we're hoping we'll have covered these. Again, I'm not going to read them out, but we'll have a look at some of the research, we'll have a look at some of the key terms, and we'll have a look at some of the, the stress responses and how our bodies actually respond to what's going on. Um, it, we're all finding different bits of this difficult, um, but my um, experiences and what people tell me is that understanding that it's a biological response can be incredibly helpful. It isn't weakness it isn't that we're being awkward it's not that we're being difficult whether we're a little person or a big person this is a biological response to what's going on and what goes on around us even outside of a pandemic uh, so this is what we're going to look at um, okay so um Jill's mentioned about brains being built up over time this is my go-to website if you're out there and you've not seen the Harvard Centre for the Developing Child go and have a look it is a huge website wealth of information and what they talk about are the brains are built up over time from the bottom up. Um, and again, they do use the word architecture, Jill, but it's constructed through ongoing process that begins before birth and continues right into adulthood. You know, this idea that you only learn until a certain age um, isn't true. You know, there'll be people out there that have learned things during lockdown. There'll be people out there who are learning to drive. Um, you know, we do all those things as um, as adults, so it continues. It might get a bit harder to learn things as we get older, but it doesn't stop. Um, wrong mouse. So, a few um, of the some of the key terms, and the, my key message here is: don't worry too much about the language because it changes depending on who you talk to. So, in in education, we use the term neuroscience. But actually, what we mean by that in, in our world is a whole host of sciences. We use photography and imaging techniques. It, it still amazes me that we can take colour um, images of newborn babies' brains. 
we use biology and chemistry to understand how blood, blood and oxygen work and how they move around our bodies and what they do. We use medicine and psychology to try and understand what happens when things go wrong. So it, it, it's, a, it's a broad term and there are certain branches of science that also use the term neuro, neuroscience. So we have um, cognitive neuroscience, we have educational neuroscience, we have behavioural neuroscience, computational neuroscience. The list is ever expanding really as our knowledge grows. Um, so I use the term neuroscience in, it means interested in brains. And I think in, in early years we are, we're interested in brains. We're interested in children's brains um, and we're interested in our brains. Um, so this is say, a very, very simplified version. Um, but neurons are connected via neural pathways. Connections um, enable communication between different parts of the brains. New ones develop as we learn new things. And then the older ones get pruned Sometimes they, you, you forget something, don't you? You'll be halfway through and think, oh, I'm sure I used to know that. And it might take a little while for you to remember it because that pathway hasn't been used for a long time. And um, I think it was Phil that was saying how practitioners have been saying that children have forgotten things because they haven't been doing them. So it might take a little bit more time. You might hear the term um, myelin or myelination, which is a fatty substance that wraps around the nerves to help quicker communication. Um, and then this idea of plasticity, sometimes called neuroplasticity. So the idea that the brain has a huge ability to change and adapt. And I think we've proved that over this last nine months. We've changed and we've adapted and it's been really difficult for some of us. Some people have found it easier, some people have found it hard. And we've found different things difficult, but we've done it. You know. NCB staff have done an amazing job to put this on and create this virtually. We wouldn't have dreamt of doing this a year ago. And we've learned how to use the technology to our advantage. Not always, doesn't always work, but on the whole, we're doing a really good job of it. So we can do this, we can adapt, and children can too. The key brain area is, again, a really, really simplified version uh, of a picture of a brain. Um, you'll have heard these words, or you might have heard them slightly different language. Um, the brain stem is the bit at the back of your head, you, you can feel it, it's sometimes called the reptilian brain. The limbic system right in the center, completely surrounded and cocooned, often called the mammalian brain, um, often talked about in terms of um, where memories and self-esteem and um, self-confidence, those kinds of things are. And then the cortex, this big bit um, at the front where all the learning and thinking happens, so sometimes called the neocortex. Um, the nervous system is incredibly important. So nerves all over your body, obviously. They, travel the message, they send the messages, it gets to your spinal column, it up your spinal column, and they go into uh, to the back of your head. So there's only five ways you can get message into your brain, and that's the five senses, which makes sense in early years. That's what we do. That's how we plan our, uh, our curriculum. We, we look at what can children taste and touch and smell and hear and all and see and all those kinds of exciting things. Um, what's not often talked about is that big red um, arrow across the middle there, the RAS filter. I can never say this right, but it's a reticular activating system. If I say it slowly, but the RAS filter works. The um, reticular just means net-like, um, and so if you can imagine you've got a net-like group of um, nerves at the top there, that, and their job is to catch the information. And if it's useful, they send it on to the right place. If it's not useful, they think, ah, not taking any notice of that. But it plays a big role in the fight, flight, feet, freeze response. If your brain's scared, if your brain's worried, if it's frightened, the RAS filter shuts down. And it only lets information through that's relevant to that threat at that moment in time. Um, and I'll come back to that um, a little bit later. Um, but th this is kind of a really simplified version. Um, I, five senses is incredibly important. You know, back again, linking back to what Bill said about the importance of the prime areas. What's going on with those five senses? How are children feeling? And how are we, can we help make sure that those right messages get to where they need to be? So, there are specific areas within the brain, but they're all interconnected. They do different jobs, but they need the help from each other. Um, and what the research shows is that when the RAS filter is overactive, um, 
impacts on people like so post-traumatic stress disorder it means that we've got a constant response we stay in that fight flight freeze mode um, okay so how the brain responds so the brain responds to stress um, there's two types of stress or stressors stress can be external so things like being too hot being too cold um, the environment's not right abusive relationships that kind of thing or internal sort of illness psychological problems worry and anxiety um, and we respond by either positive stress response and that might sound a bit um, is that but if you've got a deadline to me and you need to finish a document you've got to get it finished really quickly your stress response kicks in might not feel like it because it's not the same as being chased down the street by a lion but it is there and what it helps the, your body to do is to concentrate so the RAS filter shuts down and helps you to concentrate on what it is that you need to do and get that document finished and done on time we have um tolerable stress responses um, which is the alert system it lasts a little bit longer um, so that things like grief and loss um, and when we're in those kind of situations and that's when relationships become incredibly important when you've got somebody to buffer somebody to hold your hands somebody to listen somebody to help somebody to say actually we'll help you through this you'll be okay the difficulty comes when it's a toxic stress response and toxic stress tends to be the term that that Harvard have adopted and um, when the stress doesn't go away it's strong and it's frequent or it's prolonged and I was interested to there was an article um research article last week that more people have experienced stress um since Halloween to now than through the beginning of the pandemic because as it's gone on a longer time people were hoping that there would be an end to it more people are actually now finding that their mental health is 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 struggling more than it was earlier so the problem comes when we don't have the buffers when we don't have somebody there whether we're a child or a, a grown-up when we don't have somebody there to hold physically hold or um, practically hold us and to help us kind of work our way through it that's when the fight flight freeze response kicks in so you'll have heard of these but you know the fight can i stay and fight am i strong enough am i big enough can i can i deal with this on my own the flight, can I outrun it? So if you're thinking of you know, um, a, a lion and a, a deer, the deer's looking and can I run? Can I, can I beat the lion? Can I run away? Freeze one is your body's last line of response, really. It, that's the one where it's actually the best option here is to lay down and play dead and hope it walks past me. But we see it in children and these are the children that worry me the most. We will all know children who are in fight mode and we will all know children who are in flight mode but the children who are in freeze mode the ones that stay really quiet really still hope you don't notice are the ones that are probably having more difficulty than some of the others there's not as much for you to see to see what's going on there's been some research recently and they've added another three that are, are less common flooding that bit feeling flooded with emotions and I'm sure we've all been in that situation you just feel completely overwhelmed with it all it's like I, I don't even know what to do anymore there's the fatigue one I am so tired now I have had enough I've had enough of all this and I just need to go to bed and your world is in chaos but you sleep incredibly soundly it's almost as if your body goes you know what there's far too many emotions going on here far too many stress hormones we just need to sleep and then the other one, mainly kind of in, in um, relation to threat of being captured. Um, so it's, it's come out about a lot of people who've been kidnapped. Fawning that, that cooperation or just submitting um, to what's going on. The fight, flight, freeze are the, are the three main ones. But the, the others are, are there as well. So we'll have all experienced some of this to lesser or greater de degrees over the last nine months and might still over the next six months as we face more uncertainty and we're still not kind of quite sure what's going on but for me the reason I love this stuff so much the reason I get so excited about it is because it helps to know that there's a biological response this isn't um little Jimmy being awkward and kicking off in the corner this is a stress response this is a hormonal response to what's going on and we'll cover that um, a little bit more um, in in the later sessions okay so i'm going to stop talking because that was just the intro and then we'll do a bit more in a minute <laughs>